Welcome to episode 84 of the Talking Friars podcast. Ben Fadden here today, uh, lockout still uh, with Jacob Redondo. Uh, he was a former teammate of mine, uh, so I, I, you know, big Padre fan, so figured to get him on here uh, during this offseason. Jacob, what's up? How's it going? I'm good, man. Ben, best second baseman I've ever played with. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right, so let's first start off kind of just background on yourself. Uh, how you kind of became a Padre fan uh, and kind of what your best memories are, you know, thus far. Um, I mean, I'm born and raised a Padre fan. Um, I mean, I'm always like a local boy. I was raised a Charger fan until they left. Um, yeah. This is going to sound weird, but I'm a Clippers fan, even though they left. Um, I mean, didn't really seem like San Diego wanted to keep them anyways in 84. Um, my first ever game was uh, Tony Gwynn's last game. And I don't even know if I was a month old yet. Um, so I didn't really get a choice, but I'm really glad I'm a Padre fan because when we win, it's going to feel good. It's going to feel better than like the Dodgers because we haven't had it. So, yeah. Um, Blowing it every year doesn't doesn't really uh, sound too good to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, what what about uh, your favorite memories, favorite memory this far? Would it be the, the Musgrove no hitter or what? Um, from last season? Yeah. I would say the Musgrove no-hitter um, because I I missed the first inning because I was on my way home. And, I mean, I saw the whole game. I mean, I remember it, like, perfectly. I remember Grisham just came off the I.L. from a hamstring. And then around the sixth or seventh inning, I'm like, man, no-hitter? But, like, I've seen this many times before. I mean, like, Jordan Lyles blew it. Um, I remember Odrismir Despagne blowing it after he pulled his pants down for some reason. I remember everything like that. Edwin Jackson had one pretty good. Edwin close. Jackson, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. He was yeah. pretty good when he was on the Padres. Yeah. But anyway, what I was saying is I, I love that moment because I was watching it with my dad and my stepmom. And my dad actually ended up crying when it happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. My mom went nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I was keeping score and I was like, holy cow, like. <laughs> I don't see any hits here like and they kept showing the scoreboard and then Don you know mentioned it and I was like oh here we go this isn't you know it's <laughs> one of those jinx type things and then but once like the the line out I think to Jake uh in the uh the ninth inning that was when it was or no to Myers uh the line out to Myers it was like right. okay yeah, it's yeah, gonna yeah, happen yeah, right like yeah I think so yeah. yeah that's gonna happen like it's gonna happen like there's there's plays where you know, if there's no special play that happens, it's kind of like, OK, the no hitter's not going to happen. But when there's a special play or a play that, you know, needed to be made, it's kind of like it was like meant to be like I remember the Mike Fires no hitter. I think Semyon made like a diving play. This was a couple years ago. And it was like, OK, it's going to happen because that tough play is already out. It's, it's already happened. Um, right. So, yeah, that, that was uh, the closest I've ever felt to, you know, winning or NL pennant or winning a world series. So yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely a cool moment. Uh, before getting into this current Padres team, I don't know if you saw in my last episode about Tony Gwynn and I was kind of mind boggling. I was just sitting around my house and it was mind boggling. He never won an MVP. And so I just went through all the stats, all the years of him and just comparing, comparing him to the guy that won. And, you know, 1987 was like his best chance. He, had, you know, I know war wasn't a big, you know, wasn't really a thing back then, but he had blew Andre Dawson out of the water and that 1995 was a close one. Uh, I guess my question to you is, were, are you kind of surprised like me that he never took home an MVP despite being one of the greatest hitters of all time? I actually, um, so I did listen to the podcast. Um, I actually disagree on the year though, that I think he should have won it. Okay. I definitely think the year that Ryan Sandberg won it in 84, that should have been Tony Gwynn's year. Okay. And I say that because he's in his second year in the league, mm -hmm. right? And he's taking the Padres to where they've never, ever been before, the playoffs. And it's only happened five times, like right. five or six times in our whole franchise's history. You can't tell me a guy in his second year taking – it's just like Tatis taking the Padres to the playoffs uh, yeah. in 2020. You can't tell me that's not valuable. And I'm – I'm a stickler for value when it comes to most valuable player. Like I was disappointed Tatis didn't win MVP last year, but I don't think any of the three should have won it. I think it should have been Austin Riley 
because he had a monster year and he took him to the playoffs and eventually they won the world series. Mm. Okay. Yeah. At, the only thing I'd say in 84. Okay. So that I mentioned in the episode, that's the highest he ever placed, which is also mind boggling third that's place, true. the highest he ever, you know, placed. Uh, yeah. He played two more games than he did, but his war was two wins less. He led the NL in average. So that's a big and on base percentage or he had a better on base percentage than Sandberg, but slugging percentage was much lower. Home runs was much lower. RBIs was much lower. And I, I get, and so I think they kind of compared, you know, back then, you know, war wasn't a big thing. Uh, you know, on base percent OPS, those things weren't big. It was just the, you know, the home run RBI stats. So I think maybe just based on that, I think maybe some voters were like, okay, he has the better, you know, old school stats. Ryan Sandberg kind of had it better than Tony, but right. like there were some years where those old school stats that were being used, Tony had that over the guy that won. And then he mm -hmm. placed like eighth or ninth that year. It, it wasn't even like he placed, you know, top three, like he did in 84. Right. And then also, I mean, the other year when he hit 394, I mean, there mm -hmm. weren't, playoffs that year so right. anybody should have been up for grabs and I've never seen anybody hit 400 you've never seen anybody hit right. 400 how is that I mean Jeff Bagwell won it that year right yeah see I don't find that very I mean yeah so in 94 Bagwell's average was uh 368 so it was still really good right uh, 451 uh on base percentage Tony's was 454. So they were close. They both played the same amount of games. Um, right. And then I think what maybe home runs, right? Yeah. So Bagwell had 39 home runs. Tony only had 12. And then Bagwell had 116 RBIs. Tony had 64. So it was right. a big gap there. So I could see why they went the way that they did. But like, like I mentioned, 94 was probably the, the third. If I had a number three, like year that he could have won. You know, 84 is a good one, too, but yeah. just because of the his, the history and how historic that number at hitting 394 is, especially back then, like back then, that was the big stat average. What's your average? That was the big stat where now it's kind of like war, OPS, home runs, uh, stuff like that. But, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting, uh, you know, conversation uh, with Tony. And it's just. I mean, you know, 96, Tony didn't have a great year. Ken Caminetti blew him out of the water. Uh, but obviously, I'm going to be fine with that. It was a Padre, you know? Right. I think, he was, I think he was riddled with injuries that year, too. Yeah, yeah. Like he was uh, that, in the last two years as well. Yeah, that, that did kind of hurt him during his career. And obviously, he wasn't in the greatest shape, you know, that you know, like the second half of the year. Right. Uh, but he, he was still hitting. Like, so. Mm -hmm. um, but let's move to the current team. What was your uh, reaction to AJ Preller bringing in Bob Melvin? Uh, obviously, we, you know, that name wasn't, you know, brought about. Uh, it was good to see Tingler gone. Obviously, I was not a fan of that. You know, I think it was my junior of high school uh, when that happened. And I was not a good person to be around when we had Ron Washington just sitting right there. Uh, but what was your reaction to kind of the Tingler tenure and then uh, Bob coming in? Well, I mean, I think the big thing, well, I'm, obviously I'm really excited about Bob Melvin mm -hmm. and I like what they've done with the coaching staff. Um, everything we've done so far, I want to say we're on the down low winning the off season because it wasn't, we didn't need to make that, that big move, which we still might with the rumors of Cassianos or Bryant, but like, we don't need that big, that big move. We needed addition by subtraction and wink, wink, Eric Hosmer is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but I'm really pumped that they brought in uh, Bob Melvin because from the interviews I've heard, he focuses on trusting the starters and not relying on the relievers as much. And I think that was the main issue last year, along with um, injuries. And if you get a full season of Tatis, 150 games or so, and you can get those starters going deeper into games, I think we're set. Yeah, and – you know, the, the team of the offseason probably this far is probably the Mets, just in terms of moves that they made. Right. But the Mets had a bigger gap to make up than the Padres did, even though, you know, the Padres obviously had a losing record last year. The Mets, they just have more flaws. They don't know about DeGrom. Uh, and the Padres really, 
a big key. It's not really like adding players. It's keeping the players that they have just healthy. Like right. imagine if Snell was healthy, if Darvish didn't have those back and hip issues and Tatis didn't have the subluxations, which that's why I thought he should have got surgery, but that's kind of another topic. But um, you know, it's just, it's just keeping guys healthy and hopefully maybe I don't know about the training staff or whatever, but just hopefully they can have better injury luck. Cause, and I just don't see those injuries happening again. I don't know about you, you know, back to back seasons. Right. And another thing is, I mean, we're getting Clevenger back. That's already like a big free agent. Um, one thing too, I will add is he's pitching with a pitching coach named Dom Johnson in Poway. And I used to pitch there as well. I used to pitch there with Joe Musgrove. Oh, okay. Expect a nasty change up from, Mike Clevenger, because that's that pitcher's or that pitching coach's specialty. Is you that the uh, the the uh, the videos that he's posting on Instagram? Kind of looks like a just not even like rich place at all. It's just just a mound. There, and there's yeah. two mounds in his. It's a nice house, but there's two mounds in the backyard, and he's throwing gas back there, like yeah. a lot of guys do. Um, Matt Bush had his comeback there. Um, do you know Chris Davinsky? Yeah. Yeah, he he has one of the nastiest changeups I've ever seen in my life. Um, he he works out back there, and Musgrove does as well. All right, expect a nasty changeup. Okay, that's my prediction. Um, yeah, so sticking with Preller, do you think that you know the pot? This is time for him. The Padres have to make at least the playoffs and a deep playoff run consistently over the next few years for him to keep his job, despite the you know contract extension Seidler gave him. Yeah, that's the tough thing. I think this year is a make or break for AJ, um, unfortunately, because I do like all the moves that he makes. It's really just I feel like it's the development and the coaching. It's not really him because I feel like he's finding the talent because we've seen these guys like uh, like Urias go over to other teams, hit 20 plus home runs. Um, the only thing is the only thing I would critique Preller on is he gives up on players really quickly. Yeah. And. and I mean, we would have Max Freed. Um, he gave up on Renfro. Renfro had a monster year. Um, and I know he didn't like being here his last year. Um, mm -hmm. Or else I would have said, hey, let's go get Hunter Renfro to play left field because that's a cheaper option. Um, Taylor yeah. Trammell kind of irked me. He yeah. didn't even play a full season in the minor leagues, and he just trades him. Like... Right. And then don't get me started on Ty France. Yeah. That, trade was, that was the worst AJ Preller trade I think I've seen so far. Yeah. Um, because Munoz is going to come out next year as their closer eventually, whether it's in the beginning of the year or the middle of the year, he's going to be throwing a hundred plus and it's going to be a lecture. Yeah. Um, I think that I disagree with it this year being the year because of the new coaching staff and everything. Right. I think that if something doesn't work out this year, then they're going to, they're going to say, okay, let's give one more year. Um, uh, you know, Myers probably won't be here after next year. Like just see any new additions that happen at, you know, next off season. I think so. If, if, if there's not success the next two years or a deep playoff run by next year, I think I don't, I don't, I, unfortunately I don't think Seidler is going to make a move because from everything he said, Oh my goodness, he's like married to Preller. So I'm thinking it's going to be more of a like step down type of thing if it yeah. if it ever does happen um i think they'll be okay next year though i yeah, uh, yeah. in 96 they made the playoffs had a crazy run if anyone wants to look that up to sweep the dodgers take the division then they got swept in the playoffs by the cardinals the next year they had high expectations didn't do well in 97 then the following year they went to the world series the furthest they've ever gone so yeah i think right. this is going to be the year that we take a huge step forward Hopefully. Um, you kind of mentioned this earlier, but talk a bit more about you being in that trade Hosmer camp. Um, would you want, would you be willing to attach, uh, you know, a Luis Camposano to that to get him out? Or is it something where you're willing just to take on, you know, the Padres should just take salary, you know, keep some of the salary on, but just don't give up, you know, Robert Hassel or Luis Camposano in a deal. I'm not trading Robert Hassel for anybody yeah. right now. I'm not trading CJ Abrams. Um, if anybody I'm trading, I'm trading Mackenzie Gore or Campusano, maybe. Maybe Campusano. Because I do like Campusano a lot. But there's been a trend where 
these catchers are top prospects, but then they don't really pan out in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. And we, we saw him struggle last year. I know he came up really early, but there's already that, you know how I said AJ Preller just gives up on players. I'm thinking it's going to be Capusano if anybody that's going to be attached with Hosmer. Yeah, that's just because, I mean, that Jorge Alfaro deal really kick-started me thinking that Campusano is going to be gone. Uh, and I think the only way that he would be gone is in a Hosmer deal to mm -hmm. attach him to a bad contract because why would you trade him, you know, it's just singular, singularly. Like, tr just trading him, what are you going to get back for that? They don't need a top you're not what outfielder is there available, you know, power hitting outfielder. If they don't get a Brian or a Castellanos that's available, that would be, you know, good enough to trade Camp Rusano for. But just with that, I mean, just trading for Alfaro was just kind of weird for me. I don't know about you. Um, well, I mean, he was tied, obviously, to the Texas Rangers. Um, yeah. That's another thing that Preller's never going to get over. But um, one thing I would say is, I've I've seen a lot of things on Twitter when people are like, oh, we need to we need to just DFA Hosmer. That is probably the dumbest thing you could possibly do. Yeah. Because why would you just eat the money when he could just be a bench? He's not the worst bench bat. Like, come on. Yeah. Not saying that I want a bench bat worth a hundred whatever million he got. Yeah. But I'm saying if you cut him, you get absolutely nothing. And the only way I would trade a prospect is if you're getting a lot of money back in return or you're getting a player back in return. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned with Hosmer on the bench, I mean, they did it last year and it was, it was, I mean, Cronenworth's great at first. Um, I think that if they don't find, if there's no DH, which I think that there would be, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't be confident in having Hosmer, you know, be the DH if there is a full-time DH, but if there's not one having him on the bench, like that's not even like the worst option if you can't find exactly what you want on the trade market, like he does have power and to be, right. he's a, I'd rather have him up there to be honest in a power situation, even if he will strike out or ground up to second than a Ha Sung Kim, because I know he can at least, there's a chance that he's going to hit one into the gap or right. hit it over the fence. Like Kim, it's not real. like the Reds game, maybe that one uh, last year, but like, He's not going to – he doesn't have that home run power, and that's what the Padres need, really. Right, and then another thing I like to point out to my buddies when we debate on Hosmer is, I mean, I know we hype up these coaches, but that hitting coach that we just hired, mm -hmm. his specialty is launch angle, and that's exactly what Hosmer needs. If he could just fix Hosmer, that would be the biggest win of the offseason. Yeah. So just get that swing just a little bit, going a little bit up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If he could – Because it's not even – yeah, it's not even like people want to point to launch angle leading to more home runs. It's not even that. It's in runner on third situations, two out or one out, and you ground up to second. That guy can't move in and score. You have launch angle. You have a fly out to right instead of a ground out, and there's another run. Those those add up. Right, and then that's another thing, too, with um, Tatis is he's going to mature this year, I think, Last year when he was chasing the 100 RBIs, he would swing out of his shoes trying to hit a bomb. I think he's going to mature into – like I think Manny's going to get him into this zone of mind where just get the run in. Don't try to hit a home – you don't need to hit a home run every single time. And I think that's a, a lot of where the struggles came from last year with the Padres is I feel like Grisham got into some balls early in the year and then he just tried to, to yank the ball a lot. Um, Cronenworth had a good year last year, obviously an all-star year, but I feel like he was trying to pull the ball a little bit too much rather than spraying the ball. Um, and his average went down a little bit, not that it was terrible, but it went from around a 300 hovering around 300 to two sixties, two seventies. Yeah. He went from a big, uh, I think at the beginning of the year, if I remember correctly, he had a big stretch of time where he like didn't strike out. And then those strikeouts came. So I think I'm, I i do not think he played into it, but I think the crone zone thing kind of did play into it a little bit right. with pulling and pulling the bar, uh, pulling the ball. But I think that, I mean, as we move just through this off season after the lockout, like the big priority obviously is power, but if power doesn't come and I was big on Avisel Garcia, 
uh, he went to Miami. But if that power doesn't come somehow and they bring back Tommy Pham and they sign someone else, I think Michael Berdar, like you mentioned, that's going to be a huge factor. Like, can he do something with Hosmer, do something with Pham? He, he had a little bit more ground outs. Just do something, you know, relax Grisham a little bit. Find right. some power somehow in the catching position because if they could find any power in Nola and if he could stay healthy, I mean that would be huge. I don't obviously we don't know what Alfaro's role is going to be, and if I don't again I don't see them carrying four guys. Uh, I see can't I don't see Campristano staying in AAA all year either. So I think that, and I don't see him being a DH to be quite honest either or any of those four catchers. So um, I think that. Move, the move moving Camposano or moving one of the catchers is probably going to happen. Um, but I think that someone else that there's talk of being moved, but not as much as Hosmer as Myers. I think that they should just ride it out. You know, he's been I here, agree. give him another chance to win for San Diego. He's been here longest tenure Padre. He was here when they, you know, choked that build up with Kemp and Upton and everyone. And then he was here, through the, all the rebuild years. So I think it's only fair. Uh, it's only one year. It's not as bad as Hosmer. I think they should, you know, ride Myers is out. I, and another thing I've, I haven't heard from anyone is it's your last year with uh, Myers contract wise. Um, you could bring him back if you want, but um, I think if him and Hosmer could just play first base, it's a very expensive platoon but Myers had his best year when he was playing first base, mm -hmm. um, if you ask me. And I just – I think he's super athletic still. He could still move well. And he's a better fielder at first base than Eric Hosmer. Right. In, I in think, my opinion. I, yeah. I think the only problem in that, though, is who is going to play the outfield then? You have – so now you have Grisham and no one else if Myers is going to platoon at first. I know you could play him in the outfield a little bit, but if you're talking about platooning him at first with him being a righty, Haas being a lefty, who's going to play the outfield? Profar is not an everyday outfielder, and I don't see them signing multiple power hitting outfielders. Maybe right. a, maybe like a Nelson Cruz for the DH, but not two power hitting outfielders. What I'm trying to say is that would be worst case scenario in my mind, but it also would make room for C.J. Abrams to play the outfield, which yeah. – I think he's athletic enough to play the outfield, whether it's left or right. Um, and I think it would be left because I don't think he has a very good arm from what mm. I saw in spring training last year. Um, that solves the problem where you're like, where, what am I going to do with Jake Cronenworth and CJ Abrams? There's a, there's, there's a, a, it's clogged right there. That was the whole reason he got rid of Adam Frazier. And I just think Abrams can play the outfield. Um, but that's worst case scenario, like I said. Yeah, and Abrams, I don't I don't think Abrams is going to be ready at the beginning of the year anyway. So I think he would have been, but that injury set him back. Yeah. And I was thinking if he played fall ball, he might have a shot, but he's definitely going to start the year in double A or triple A, whichever it is. Yeah. Um, we talked about Brian and Castellanos a little bit. Who would you rather uh sign, Brian or Castellanos? Ah, uh, man. See. The San Diegan in me wants to say Chris Bryant, um, but I want to say Castellanos because I just feel like he, man, it's it's really tough because they're pretty even. I would just say Castellanos because I know Bryant's had some injury troubles. Mm, okay. He, he did fall off a little bit at the end of last year. Not that it yeah. was crazy, but, I mean, the Giants were just having a crazy year. Everyone was on – Everyone was having their best year, um, and he would he would sit the bench a couple of games. I mean, he wasn't always the starter, right? Um, but I think I would go with Castellanos, even though I think Castellanos, when he gets this big deal, he might struggle in his first year, like a lot of guys do. Yeah, I think the way that it's trending, I'd rather go Bryant. Uh, I think that Cast. I know Bryant. He's Boris, right? I think he's a Boris age uh, client. Um, so he that's. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Okay, so maybe that's not a big deal then, but I think that Castellanos is probably going to get overpaid just right. because he's he's uh, had a really good year last year, obviously, better than Bryant, at least power-wise. I think that 
I'd, I'm big on versatility and, you know, we've been talking about <clears throat> who's going to play the outfield, who can play, the, you know, multiple positions. That's huge. He can play third. He can play short. Uh, he could probably play short a little bit. Uh, I mean, first base too. <laughs> yeah, he could play first. He can play all three outfield positions. He likes center field. I mean, so that's what he said. Um, and Castellanos can't do that. Bryant can DH if you need him to. So I think that the versatility is a big reason why I would go Bryant. Uh, and I think that Castellanos is going to get more, I don't know about more years, but he's certainly going to get a higher AAV. That would be the only reason. Um, and, you know, with the Tatis contract coming in, uh, you know, the, he's getting higher pay. He's going to be higher paid now moving forward. Um, you want an extension for Musgrove. What about Snell Darvish a couple years down the line? I think that while we, we really want that power outfield bat, I think that having more flexibility with that power bat is, you know, that, that would be the best scenario. Right. And I do agree that Cassianos is definitely going to get overpaid. Um, I feel like Brian's more of a winner too, if you would ask me. Um, I mean, Cassianos did it in a very small ballpark last year as well. Um, we have to take that into account. And Bryant has had success at Petco, um, hitting a home run in the All-Star game, um, just being around San Diego. I, I mean, it's it's really close with me. Um, the reason I said Cassianos is because I know he could hit a bunch of doubles. Um, and Bryant's swing is more of a launch angle type swing. Um, but really, it's either one. Um, it's pretty much 50-50 for me. Yeah, and – I, I mean, to be honest, I'd be happy with either one, obviously, you know, because right. they just need that power, you know, that they're just desperate for power because where are you going to get it outside Machado uh, and, and uh, Tatis? Because Cronenworth, I, I don't see him hitting that at many home runs every year. Uh, Myers obviously only has one more year and he's like 17 home run guy. I'm, we're talking we need like a 30 home run guy. And right. Brian's done that in his career. Castellanos obviously did that last year. Um, so just, again, the ideal offseason, I guess that's kind of my last question here. The ideal offseason, obviously, is getting that power outfield bat, mm -hmm. uh, addition by subtraction, obviously, with Hosmer. Um, but Guaranteed. what else? Is, is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't think you, Darvish, needs a personal catcher with a four ERA, if, if you ask me. Right. I think that's true. And. But also, I would, I would attribute kind of some of his uh, his injuries to that ERA uh, right. last year. Yeah. Uh, but and I would also can think about Musgrove. I think Musgrove doesn't need a personal catcher, um, but he obviously succeeded really well with Caratini last year. Mm -hmm. um, but what would just what would be your ideal off season? I mean, they filled out that coaching staff pretty nicely and. Mm -hmm. They're making moves in the developmental system. Um, I really think that was the main thing. But on the 26-man roster, um, they've filled out this bullpen a little bit. I like the way they've done that. I don't know about the signing from um, – what was the guy's name from Japan? Uh, Robert Suarez. Was that it? the starter? Oh, Nick off? Martinez. Yeah, Nick, Nick Martinez. Martinez. Yeah. I didn't agree with that one either. Four I years don't know about that one. <laughs> But I mean, if he could have, I mean, I saw that he shortened up his his uh, his arm slot. Yeah. Makes it go harder. Everybody knows that. Um, if he could have a good year, that would be a steal. Um, I really like what they've done so far. If they can't sign one of these huge big time Bryant or Cassianos outfielders, I would really be cool with Jock Peterson and Myers platooning in right mm -hmm. um, with. I wouldn't mind if they brought fam back um, coming off the bench mainly. Um, I don't know if I could watch another year of him starting, but I do think Jock Peterson, whether he's starting in left field or platooning with Myers and right, I think that would be a big move as well. Yeah. I think what about Conforto people bring up him. I'm not a big fan of him. Obviously another Boris guy and Boris is saying how much interest there is. It kind of feels like a, Boris Hosmer situation again where he's yeah. where he's just lying about the interest because he had a terrible year last year and while he's good at defense uh I don't know I, there's just something about him where 
It's like I agree. I'm not. I wouldn't go all in on him. Like I wouldn't go all in on Conforto, especially when the Mets are dangling Jeff McNeil out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's another option. Um, he had a bad year last year, but I mean, bad year. What he hit two fifty. That's yeah, not terrible. But the, his other years, he was up at, towards the leaders in the National League in hits. So I mean, right. I would be completely fine with him as well. Yeah. All right. This has been fun. Episode 84 of the Talking Fires podcast with Jacob Redondo, Ben Fadden here. Uh, Thanks so much for listening, watching, and until next time, let's go Padres.